Welcome to the France 54 debate, NATO's next step. What future for the alliance with or without America? Trump's defense secretary, James Mattis, dropped a metaphorical bombshell at the NATO meeting in Brussels. If the rest don't pay more, the U.S. may moderate its commitment. Mattis, who bears the nickname Mad Dog, had earlier stated reassuringly that NATO remained for the U.S. a fundamental bedrock for cooperation. But then came the barb. Mad Dog Mattis barking that NATO states should show support for common defense if they don't want the U.S. to moderate its commitment. Trump, it was, in January, who declared NATO to be obsolete. This raised concern in capitals across the Atlantic that the organization that had been the bastion of world peace and security for nearly 70 years should be so dismissed by Trump, businessman in chief, as some people call him. And Trump's real or virtual links to Russia are raising more and more concern among those states that used to be part of the former Soviet Union, the Baltic countries, fearing, suffering the same fate as Ukraine, but perhaps an indifferent USA, led by Trump, looking on. We meet the guests uh, after we uh, go to our correspondent uh, who's been monitoring this uh, NATO meeting for us, uh, Maeve McMahon, who is uh, awaiting us in Brussels. Maeve, give us a, a taste of what has been said and what people have been saying. Well, you've got it fairly tight there yourself, uh, Mark. Basically, full assurance today from uh, James Mattis, the US Secretary for Defence, that he remains very much committed to the NATO alliance. He called it one of the most successful military alliances uh, in modern history, that it was a fundamental bedrock for the United States, and it had the full backing of the US President Donald Trump. But, he said, this support could wane if member states of uh, the alliance did not pledge and agree to boost more um, their defence spending when it came to the alliance. He said that for the moment, the United States were paying their uh, lion's share. And he said that only five out of the 28 NATO members were reaching the target, which is 2% of annual GDP. Now, James Mattis, as you said, is known uh, among many as a mad dog, but he's also much loved and respected by the US Marines. And that because, that's because he's a straight talker. And he very much used that tone today when he gave a very lengthy uh, intervention in the room. He said that American citizens and taxpayer, taxpayers would not be paying for the freedoms uh, of Westerners and therefore not be paying for what the Europeans should be pledging money towards and uh, very much paying for it. He said that if uh, member states of uh, this alliance, the NATO, could not afford this 2%, that they would just have to set out some sort of a, pa a plan or some sort of a timetable in order to do so. He basically said he didn't want to hear any nice words. He wanted action. Now, Maeve, you were kind enough to tell me that the UK, Estonia, Poland, Greece and the US are the ones who are meeting this uh, 2% um, uh, threshold that you're talking about. What was the tone uh, around the room when Mattis made that statement about, you know, if people don't cough up, the US may moderate its commitment? Well, concern, of course, because this is also domestically a pretty tricky issue, because one thing is the defence ministers here at NATO all nodding around the table much, and very much agreeing that they want a lot of money to be given to them to look after the area of defence, which they're in charge of. But then they go back to their capitals and go face to face with their finance ministers. And that conversation gets a little bit tricky. It's the finance ministers, of course, who have control over those purse strings. And if you take a country like Germany, a country that was mentioned many times by Donald Trump for not pledging enough to the alliance. It's currently paying 1.5% of its GDP. Well, there's elections coming up in autumn in Germany and pledging more money towards defence is not something that really wins you voters. So we might have to even wait as long as till at the end of the year to see how Germany decides uh, really to pledge. But most ministers of defence here today were happy to meet a face of the new um, white or the new represent or administration of Donald Trump um, they knew, though, however, that James Mattis was a strong defender of NATO. He's currently he's worked before as an employee of NATO, and of course he was a U.S. Marine. More telling would might might be next Monday when Mike uh, Spence comes into town, that's the Vice President of the United States, and of course when Donald Trump himself is here uh, for that big meeting scheduled for the 25th of May. Busy time ahead for you, Maeve. Thank you very much for briefing us on what happened today in that meeting with uh, Mag Dog Mattis uh, and the rest uh, of uh, NATO. Maeve McMahon, our Brussels correspondent, observing all matters for us there. Let's bring in our guests uh, for our debate here.
NATO's next step, what future for the alliance with or without the U.S. Uh, joining us uh, by Skype from Tallinn, Estonia, is Molly McHugh, foreign policy consultant and information warfare expert. Molly, good evening to you. We also have by Thank satellite you. from Washington, D.C., Yasha Munk, who is a lecturer on government at Harvard, author of The People vs. Democracy. Thank you, sir, for being with us. I'll bring you in in a moment's time. We're expecting another guest joining us from the U.K., I'll keep you paused on that one because I won't reveal who it is just yet. Here in the studio, I am pleased to announce we have with us Vice President of the Foundation for Strategic Research, former French Ambassador to NATO, 2000 to the 2005. We say permanent member, don't we, Benoit? Benoit Abouville. Benoit, I will start with you. Abouville, excuse me. I will start with you, sir. Um, when Donald Trump said NATO was obsolete, how did that make you feel? Um, I, I thought that we had... Uh a long-running dispute uh, in NATO, maybe for 30 years, about burden sharing. For 30 years? 30 years. Uh, uh, President, Clint, uh, President uh, Carter, which was not a, a real military fan, uh, set uh, the bar much higher. At that time, he asked the NATO 3%. Now we are 2%. Now you, we have a dispute of whether the Brits are above or under uh, 2%. You have countries like Greece, which are much, which are very, very uh, online, but their army is probably uh, not so efficient. So, so the, the number of 2% is very useful for the Minister of Defense. Uh, toward their budget colleague, but it's mean really nothing real because first on the high end you have external operation for example France is spending one billion three on the Sahel operation now. 1.3 billion on the operation yes, in, in, yes. in North Africa. Yes, no, of course it's appear mm. uh, on its spending on the budget, but mm. it is much more concrete than spending uh, uh, 200 million on buying uh, tanks which will stay in mm. garage. Well, second, uh, man, uh, two percent is basically about manpower. It's why we have introduced, and it was a French proposal, the idea that it will be 20 percent of the budget of defense will be toward investment because that is the real uh, is the real meat if you want then you have uh, also some problem like Tallinn for example they will spend a lot on police uh, uh, national guard and so forth because they uh, given uh, the fact that uh, they, they may have disruption by, uh, by the, the Russian on, on the minorities and so forth but that doesn't appear it is not defense and doesn't appear. So uh, the, the, the real discussion is to establish whether or not the alliance should be a two, uh, an alliance where you have three countries which are able to, to fight and the other are just uh, making it. And uh, this variable speed alliance is not exactly the solidarity. So when, uh, when uh, so, so what what the U.S. Uh, is calling for is for everybody to be equal and, and that, that contribute would, uh, in an equal way. It 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 it, it uh, I think that the, uh, for the time being there was an electoral kind of demagogic thing. The, the ally are not spending, and sure. we are and more than not, they are not spending on defense, but more the, they are cutting our job through uh, imports. It's, but uh, the, the the real issue is first to have a discussion with uh, the Trump administration because there has been so many uh, change in position of Trump indeed uh, including uh, Flynn which depart and uh, various priority terrorism uh, I think it's uh, a question, I think the Trump is a question of getting in the queue and seeing what yeah, happens exactly. and his priorities are and very it, much within the US it, borders aren't yes they? and if you have it if you say that you want to have a transactional diplomacy it's it's incompatible with an alliance because you don't know no, it's a poker game. You don't know uh, how. We, uh, so, what the partner will do? Uh, so, uh, I think we should welcome the fact that in the uh, in, uh, now and in the following days we will have three major 
uh, American representative of a new administration. So uh, at least we will begin to understand what they want on a this is reasonable the, this is way. The beginning not of, on tweet. A beginning of a lot of, a lot of exchange, <laughs> exactly. not just on Twitter or social exactly. networking. But well, let me pause you there. You mentioned Tallinn. Let's bring in Molly McHugh, who's uh, awaiting us there in uh, the capital of Estonia. Uh, Molly, the, the idea of NATO being uh, obsolete, uh, clearly something that I imagine people where you are might have reacted to in a fairly alarmed way. I think there were a lot of uh, uh, uncertainties during the campaign and in the early days of the administration about certain statements about NATO and about our commitments to our alliances. I think it's been very reassuring um, for people, especially in Tallinn and in the Baltic states, um, uh, to have someone like Secretary Mattis and to have others who sort of continue forward with um, commitments to the alliance, who are trying to reinvigorate our commitments to the alliance and who are really trying to point out that, um, you know, the, the, the message from Mattis today to the rest of the defense ministers was very clear, which he was very much laying it out for the allies. Um, we know we're in a war, we know what we need, and it's time to use this crisis as an opportunity to rebuild our alliance for ourselves and for our countries. And he's really trying to, to, to pre present a pathway for the transformative vision and change that we need for the alliance. And I think, um, you know, as Benoit said um, in the studio, um, defense is more complicated than it used to be. I think the war we're in is more complicated. That means defense is more complicated. And if we're talking about cyber war and information war and everything else, then, um, then allies should be able to contribute to their defense commitments in different ways. Um, for example, Estonia has been very forward leaning on cyber defense and on cyber security. Um, they've uh, put together a new program to allow their conscripts to serve as sort of cyber conscripts to contribute to cyber defense. Um, there's more creative ways for our allies to contribute to the 2%, to meet the 2%, and to bolster the defense fabric of the alliance. Um, and I think that um, hopefully you'll see Mattis bringing in some of these ideas, but um, uh, it's, it's, it's not just about the 2% um, and about conventional war although the sort of hard power assets are very important. Um, it's about understanding much more broadly the new security challenging faces, facing our, our countries and our alliance um, from terrorism and from other places. And uh, we really need a new vision for how to stand against that. A new vision, cyber conscripts. It sounds fascinating. Estonia, I'll remind everybody, one of the five nations meeting that 2% threshold. Molly, thank you very much. I'll bring you in in a few moments' time. Let's go to Washington. Yasha Munk awaiting us uh, from Harvard University. Good evening to you. In terms of what NATO is, I mean, obviously Trump saying it's obsolete, but maybe we don't take him on face value. However, the word does ring and have a resonance. Um, what is your opinion? The, the first thing is that Donald Trump has been incredibly irresponsible, and that's obvious. Something like NATO lives off uh, military hard power. It lives off the will of the allies to actually come to each other's defense. But it lives to a very great degree from the expectation that this is going to happen, that there is a deep commitment, especially by the major powers within it, to come to the defense of smaller powers. And so even though Donald Trump has backtracked on saying that NATO is obsolete, even though we're seeing some people like General Mattis um, uh, sending much better signals, uh, a lot of the damage has already been done. And I think Vladimir Putin will already feel emboldened to experiment on the periphery of NATO um, in order to see you know, just how far the alliance is willing to go in order to defend itself. Now, having said all of that and having pointed out that what Donald Trump is, is doing and has done is deeply irresponsible, um, I think that uh, Americans have a point in expecting European allies to spend more on their military. I think there's been a lot of mealy-mouthed uh, making excuses uh, from various European countries, including Germany. Um, you know, vague commitments to reach 2% of GDP eventually. Um, you know, and it might happen by 2020, it might happen by 2070. Um, and at the moment, when you're thinking about this with a clear conceptual lens from Europe, spending more money on your military is a win-win. Why? Because first of all, with a, a very realist um, administration in the United States, if you want people like Donald Trump to care about NATO, um, to uphold the alliance, then you need to show that you have a big stick to bring to the table and that it's in their interest to have you on their side. Um, and secondly, because I think we now have to face up to the fact that America's uh, commitment to NATO is potentially eroding over time, that Europe might have to defend itself 
on its own against various forms of Russian aggression. Uh, and if you think seriously about that, it implies uh, a great urgency in acquiring the kind of defensive weaponry and the kind of uh, military material you need in order to be safe. We are no longer, as we liked to pretend we were in countries like Germany and France and Italy, uh, surrounded by friends. We now have uh, a pretty hostile power uh, very close to us, um, and we need to take the consequences from that. Yasha, thank you very much indeed. I'll bring you back after the break. Let's go to Carl Orton, who I'm pleased to announce has joined us from uh, the United Kingdom. And Carl, I'm told you're in the Wirral, which is an area I know very well, having been born in Liverpool. And can I put this to you? If you were to go onto the streets of Liverpool or Birkenhead or somewhere like Wallasey and say, we're going to spend billions and billions on defence, how do you think people would react? It would vary. There would inevitably be a chorus of people who would say, oh, that's terrible, you should spend it on hospitals or something. And there would also be, there is a, a conservative strain in, if you, we can call it the working class, we would have done, that would say, very good, we should have a, a strong defense. Um, obviously, as your previous guest said, it's, uh, you can understand the United States' point of view in this because the Americans will go to nuclear war ultimately to protect the allies within NATO. And the NATO allies are being asked to meet only a, a quite modest uh, defense spending. But at the same time, it is, it's incredibly damaging to have ever said the alliance is obsolete or that, that he might not honor the United States commitments to it. They're not the kind of statements you can really properly take back. And that's, that's very worrying, especially since the Russians have already begun with things like Ukraine and with these um, exercises that seem to that attack the Baltics and other states. So it's a, it's a very worrying time for the alliance. Indeed, and they've deployed a cruise missile too, which again is another issue which is yeah. making people sit up and take notice. Carl, thanks for joining us. Pausing you there. Thanks to all the guests for the first half of this uh, debate. Stay with us. Uh, so much more to come after a very short break. back to the France Cat debate. Part two, is NATO obsolete, as Donald Trump says, or is it the bedrock of transatlantic cooperation, as his defence secretary told the meeting in Brussels this Wednesday? Maybe it's both. Either way, these are the facts. NATO has deployed almost 20,000 personnel across the world. Afghanistan, Kosovo, the Mediterranean, the Horn of Africa. NATO is working with the African Union to help keep the peace in several countries as we speak. NATO is helping solve the refugee crisis, which is caused by the war against jihadists in Syria and Iraq. And in Turkey, there are NATO Patriot missiles and AWACS aircraft. All this without mentioning the missile shield, which is the project in Eastern Europe. Vladimir Putin, of course, not liking that being installed one bit. Some might say he's right to have that approach. That project, of course, governed from NATO's base in Germany. So. What future for NATO, with or without the US? Big meeting today. Magdal Mattis, the new chief at the Pentagon, saying that the NATO countries, all 28, have to cough up more cash in order to not risk America reconsidering or moderating its commitments. Let's introduce our guests once again. Joining us by Skype from Tallinn in Estonia, Molly McHugh, foreign policy consultant and information war expert. Molly, thanks for being with us. By satellite from Washington, D.C., Yasha, Yasha Munk, who is a lecturer on government at Harvard and also an expert on all these issues. Great to hear from you. Great for you to be there. Carl Norton joins us from uh, the Wirral in the UK. Carl is a research fellow at the Henry Jackson Society. Carl, thanks for being with us. And here in the studio, Benoit Dabouville, former French ambassador to NATO. Thank you, sir, too. We've discussed, obviously, this idea that what Donald Trump said was very, very hurtful, very painful. Kyle Orton saying, once you said NATO's obsolete, you can't take it back. That's the problem. It's been very damaging, hasn't it, saying that? Uh, yes, at the start, but I think the, uh, the cooler head will... Uh, will uh, is, a cooler, is a cooler head possible with Trump? That's the question. <laughs> Not, but around him, I think, and you have, for example, a senator like McCain, which has sure. been with NATO since 10 years, 15 years. One question which is not uh, asked by, by mm. the American press and by president mm. is the fact that the U.S. benefits enormously from NATO. It's not a question of money only. It's a question of base, logistics. When uh, Netanyahu was in Washington, uh, the president uh, said 
unbreakable alliance. But in order to defend Israel, the Americans need their base in mm. Europe. And uh, it's a, for, for them, it is a logistical platform. Of course, Turkey, um, of course. The, the Turkey, but on, on layer, uh, Spain and so forth. Uh, at, the, at the same time, uh, in the relationship with Russia, which is the key of, of the essence of uh, NATO, uh, they, need, uh, they need to have uh, their, uh, their ally, because, because Russia ob obvious objective is to divide Europe from the US. And NATO is, was precisely founded for that. And NATO had, in the past, existential crisis. When the Warsaw Pact uh, disappeared, uh, a lot of people say, if there's why, no Warsaw Na why Pact, NATO? Why do we need NATO? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, uh, but uh, I think that we had, uh, we had Bosnia, we had Afghanistan, mm. we had uh, terrorism, and so forth. And we see ongoing uh, operations in Africa too. Yeah. In Africa, it will be, NATO is speaking of Africa, but I think that only EU and the French are in Africa. The, uh, NATO in Africa is PR. Fran PR. France spending 1.3 billion. No, no, no. Uh, yeah. I, I, we would like to have other allied, but in, in fact, NATO in Africa. Let me bring in some of the other guests, please, if you don't mind, Benoit. Benoit, our uh, former uh, French ambassador to uh, NATO. Uh, Molly, I'll, I'll bring you back in. Molly in uh, Estonia, in Tallinn there. Uh, Benoit was mentioning Ukraine, and obviously, with Estonia being a former Soviet state once upon a time, there is, we are told, the fear that people might have there that Vladimir Putin could swoop at some point. Is that something that people are really, um, it, it preoccupies people in Tallinn, is that true? I think it's, um, it's very hard to understand how people view Russia from out here, unless you're out here, where there are constantly discussions about how you would defend against attack and regular normal people. Seriously? Um, sort of sort of sit in cafes and talk about what their evacuation plan is and how they would get their family out and um, and what they would do if there was, uh, you know, sort of the wall of Russians coming over the border again. So this they is have a, it's a feeling it's a present danger then? Absolutely. But I think the, the concern here and in Ukraine and elsewhere, I mean, Ukraine is in a hot war that we all deny is happening, but um, the I think the concern in the Baltic states is less... Um, at this time in particular, sort of a Russian army coming over the wall as it is um, these sort of creeping attacks, the shadow war that we are very bad at identifying and calling out quickly and in responding to effectively, not just cyber attacks, not just hacking, but the information war, the influence war, the Russian money that's used to buy access and influence and influence politics and decision making um, and other things. And, and there's sort of this entire fabric of the Gerasimov strategy to attack the West as part of Russia's hybrid war that we really haven't focused on coherently. We have not developed an alliance strategy for, um, and that needs to be a clear part of what NATO is focusing on. I think um, Estonia and the other sort of easternmost allies uh, who feel the Russian thumb and the Russian fist around them more, more presently have a lot to contribute in terms of identifying the threat. Um, and that's where we really need to start, is sort of going back and seeing the war and understanding that NATO is our best defense against the threats that we face. Molly, bear with us. And can I just say to, to you and to our other guests who are beyond the studio joining us by Skype, of course, if you have anything to contribute at any point, don't be afraid to speak. I will try to bring you in and try to regulate how things work. Leave that to me. That's my problem. Quickly, Benoit, from you. Yes, uh, at the Warsaw Summit uh, last summer, uh, uh, NATO took the hybrid warfare case and the cyber case as element of its, uh, its uh, posture. So, so in a way, we, uh, NATO has taken on board this vo vo uh, vo vo those issues which were just uh, mentioned. The, the real issue now for NATO is, uh, I think, Ukraine and sanction because there is a risk of division between uh, uh, some people in Washington asking for uh, removing of a sanction. Uh, well, we're led to believe uh, that it was already a done deal and that's why Flynn had to go. Yeah, exactly, he but because it. he lied on that. Yeah, it was yeah. not very clear. But at that, uh, you can uh, expect that Mrs. Merkel and François Hollande, which worked on the Minsk II agreement, which yeah. is the only base for a political situation. Now, now, the issue is that Putin had, with Georgia, 
and Syria, he gambled right, and there was no reaction. If, 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 now, uh, the issue is uh, how to make the risk of anything in the Baltic state so great for Putin as a reaction that it is not worth the gamble. Bear that is the deterrence. Let's go to Washington, Yasha Munk. If, and speaking up from what Bumba just said about in order to stop anything happening in, the, happening in the Baltics, they've got to make the risk for Putin seem so great. If you have Donald Trump in the White House, does that risk from Putin's perspective feel less threatening? It absolutely does, and I, I frankly think that a lot of people in Europe are still in denial about it. And, and, and frankly, I think that uh, from what I hear from European officials and former officials, including uh, Benoit in, in this show, um, I think that people are not taking the threat seriously enough. As Molly was saying, we are not uh, acknowledging the hot war in the Ukraine. We who are sitting in capitals in France and Paris and Berlin do not understand how worried people, for good reason, are feeling in the Baltic countries. And there's a deep instinct among the sort of transatlantic elite in Europe to think that things can't possibly change in the United States, that cooler heads will prevail. You know what? They're asking us to up to 2 percent. Perhaps we should be more worried about making provisions for our own defense. But in the end, the United States will always be there. We are now in a rapidly changing political world in which populists can take over governments, align themselves with governments that do not care about the liberal world order, that do not care even about the sanctity of uh, the borders of sovereign territory in Europe, as in Russia. Um, and, and we really have to start thinking about how to confront those threats, which come in forms like cyber warfare, as Molly was saying, but which also may mean that part of the European alliance is going to crumble. I don't think that anybody in Europe uh, is asking themselves seriously enough a question of what happens if uh, somebody like Marine Le Pen might win in France, or if populists end up winning um, in other countries, um, like, say, uh, the Netherlands and so on. A lot of the idea for how we're going to defend ourselves in Europe is um, uh, one of military cooperation in which to caricature a little bit, you know, the French bring the tanks and the Germans bring the planes because famously we don't have any tanks um, and the Dutch bring the field hospital and the Belgians bring the intelligence. Well, what happens if the government of the Netherlands is suddenly allied with Russia, and they're not going to bring the field hospital because they refuse to take part in the mission. Well, uh, then you basically have the populist's veto, the person who is least hostile to Russia, the person who is most comfortable with letting Russia run wild in Central Europe, can suddenly block any real joint European military action. So I think we have to think much more carefully about what European defense would look like if cooler heads will not prevail in Washington, D.C., and if some not so cool hats keep gaining power in other European countries as well. Yasha, thank you very much. And don't hesitate to chip in if you have any thoughts. Um, you mentioned Marine Le Pen, Yasha. I mean, clearly, uh, what we know here in France is that uh, Russia has chipped into the Front National, the National Front campaign. So uh, there's an element of Russian support there. And uh, Russian um, propaganda news media setting up in France to, uh, we are told, back her campaign, support her campaign, and do the kind of fake news uh, spreading uh, which might uh, support that. And one of the candidates, Emmanuel Macron, is saying at this point that he is being targeted because he doesn't have a pro-Russia stance. So clearly what you're saying, there's something happening there. Kyle Orton uh, in the world is one of the issues that this whole NATO thing, the whole project in many ways, is nebulous and people don't appreciate what they've got. I don't think so. I think there, there was a time, especially when the Soviet Union was still here, that everybody fully understood what was happening. It's obviously had uh, evolution since the end of the Cold War. Uh, but just to go back to what the last guest was saying, Please do. The, thing is, the thing is that the, um, the alliance has already frayed to a significant extent. I mean, Trump comes in inheriting a really quite difficult situation. You, in Eastern Europe, you have Russian aggression back on the table as a real option. Russia currently occupies part of Ukraine. It's stolen Crimea. It threatens the Baltics fairly regularly and fairly openly. In Syria, the Russians have, are back now in the Middle East as a power broker. And they received, they not only didn't receive pushback, in September, the Obama administration tried to make a direct military pact to work with the Russians, retrospectively giving a political stamp of legitimacy to their intervention as well. And in Turkey, you have the United States' main 
main ground asset in the war against the Islamic State being a terrorist group that the Turks regard as their main security threat. So these problems are all landing in Trump's lap now, and he's having to try and untangle them. Now, it's not to say that there aren't troublesome elements about Trump and the people around him, because there clearly are, as we just saw by the resignation on Monday. Uh, but it's, it is to say that anybody inheriting that situation would have inherited an emboldened and aggressive Russia, and recontaining it would have been deeply troublesome, no matter the circumstances, even if they were fortunate, which of course they're not. And as you mentioned, it is a complicated situation, very complicated indeed. We report on it every day here at France 24 and all around the world people talk about it. And you point out very, very difficult things to sort out. What should NATO do from here is the question I would pose to, to everybody. Uh, Molly, can I, can I bring you in on this one? Can you start and we see where we go? I think um, what everyone has been hinting at is very much the truth. Um, the American component of the alliance has always been the steel that holds NATO together. It is the force, it is the threat, it is the <clears> thing that everyone knows is sort of keeping um, the alliance on track and provides a real deterrent to Russia and to other uh, potential aggression. Um, I think we need that commitment to be there. And there's this bizarre duality where you have the normal parts of American power, sort of military and intelligence voices and the Secretary of Defense continuing forward with the right rhetoric um, and, and sort of focus. And you have this great uncertainty about the president and his commitments and the people around him and their own beliefs in this bizarre populist world order um, allied with Putin and what they want to try to build. I think um, there is a real threat to, uh, to our countries and our alliance. I think we need to be very clear about it. And I think that this idea that our voters and our electorates have not, uh, don't really understand NATO and don't really want it and don't really appreciate it is partially because we don't communicate to them anymore about the threats that we face clearly. And we don't communicate to them about the values of the alliance and what, what America gets out of NATO, um, not just what we put into it. All of this is important going forward. Um, but I think the alliance does need a clear, concise, um, revised, transformative vision for itself moving forward, because there is no better alternative for all of our national defense and security for terrorism. I, I very Oregon. much... Go ahead, go ahead, uh, Yasha. Yeah, I, I very much agree with, 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 with Molly that, um, you know, it's not difficult to tell people that you need military spending when you make clear that there is a real threat. For 20 or 30 years, European publics had good reason to want to reduce military spending because Europe looked like a very peaceful neighborhood. And so why spend money if it looks like you're not really threatened? Now there is a real threat and good political leadership can explain that and make that clear to people. So I think that um, I'm not going to speak to what NATO should do as an entity. Um, because I think it's mostly a question of what European countries can do in response to the United States. And I don't get the impression that anybody in the United States is listening to me uh, or Molly or Bonoir or Carl. So I think we should, we, should, we should address the people who might be listening. And there's three very obvious things you need to do. The first is to, to clearly increase military spending because it allows you both to give greater value to NATO from the American perspective and to actually have better provisions for your own defense if the United States really continues to reduce its commitment. The second is to really rethink what European military cooperation would look like. You do want to have some amount of redundancy in your capacities. The complete consensus is that you don't want to double up anything. But the point is that each country, especially each big country like Germany or France, needs to be able to defend itself on its own because we're entering a populist age in which you don't know who's going to stand with you. But you should think about how to cooperate with governments whenever possible and increase the capacities for that. And the third point that I want to add is that so far we've been talking about North America and Western Europe. We have a liberal world order which is crucial to the provision of public goods throughout the world and security throughout the world. And NATO is one very big part of it, but it has effects well beyond the transatlantic space. And so now we have to think about in an era in which the United States is not committed to the liberal world order, the supposed leader of a free world order of a free world is not committed to that world order, how do we bring in countries like India, like Indonesia, like Nigeria? How do we change the liberal world order a little bit to give them a real stake in that world so that in a time when the United States is not defending it, they can come to the rescue of it 
to a certain degree. Yeah. And that too is something that European politicians would be well placed to explore. Yes, I need to stop you there. Thank you very much indeed. And of course, one wonders what happens beyond that. China, of course, President yeah. Bannon, as some people call him, talked about conflict happening there at some point. Benoit. Yeah, it's obvious that Asia will be the next ground for geopolitical debate. But uh, there is a danger if you really want to extend uh, NATO to a kind of League of Democracy, as it was proposed uh, 10 years ago by uh, Madeleine Albright, mm. uh, with India, Pakistan, uh, and so forth. Uh, at that point, you di dilute NATO to the point where the local public opinion don't understand anything. So that is the first danger. The second thing is to avoid loose talk. We, we had, uh, we had uh, Giuliani... Are you saying those countries shouldn't be brought in? To, no, to no, they are already partners. It's worked perfectly. Mm. They are partners of NATO. But, uh, but uh, the fact that the alliance should become a league of democracy or a lead of U.S. partners around the world seems to me a, a bit uh, too much for the, the, just the acceptance by, by the European public opinion. The second thing is, of course, to avoid loose talk. We, we had, for example, Giuliani, former mayor of New York, was a, a candidate to, uh, uh, for the State Department. He was saying, well, Riga is not worth a war because it is a suburb of, of St. Petersburg. Well, of course, then you understand that the Baltic uh, public opinion is a bit uh, wary about who is surrounding uh, the friend. And it of seems it. remarkable that he yeah. could have said that, given what we've heard from Mali. Exactly. But and then the third thing is, let us discuss really in depth what is the burden sharing. Who is getting what from the, uh, uh, the expenditure? The budget of NATO is, is peanuts. It's uh, one billion five. Uh, the budget of the U.S. is five and uh, six hundred fifty billions. So let, let's really uh, go back to the basic. Uh, who is spending? Uh, to what? And then the, the last point is obviously that we should have a, a policy toward, uh, toward uh, Russia. Because uh, Russia in the past was almost a partner of NATO. Mm. And then in, in around 77, uh, uh, Putin said no, because, and the, the missile shield was one of the factors. So Ukraine, missile shield, Baltic, uh, not to speak about Georgia. <laughs> So that's that's a, a lot of balls to juggle Indeed. together. Georgia 2008. Kyle Orton, a final word from you, sir. We're getting towards the end of our debate. Is it time to recalibrate with Russia, bring Russia in in some way? Is that what Trump is getting at? Is it possible? No, I, I mean, I think he has to try. It, not just because of his own campaign rhetoric, but I think it, it's always... It can't be the Western alliance that's seen to push people away. And so once he tries to engage, and say in Syria, for example, when he tries to form some sort of deal to stabilize the country and he finds that Russia is intimately tied to the Iranian revolution and to the Assad government and isn't going to let it go. And then you can move into actually uh, containing and deterring Russia. But I, I agree with um, Benoit that it's, it's back to basics. Allies need to be reassured and Russia needs to be deterred. There need to be credible and enforceable red lines to co coin a phrase. We need to leave it there. Kyle Orton, Research Fellow at the Henry Jackson Society. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Thanks to our other guests, to Molly McHugh, who joined us from Tallinn, Estonia, where people are talking in the cafes, Molly said, about the threat from Russia, which I, I find it's, it's, it makes you shiver to think about it, doesn't it? Yasha Munk joining us uh, from Washington, D.C. as well. Thank you, sir, very much indeed. And thanks to uh, Bonoa. Double vu here in the studio. Great to see you, sir. Thank, Thank you for your opinions. That uh, concludes our France Van Cat debate. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. <laughs>our guests are still in position emma james joins us too in her position how are you i'm good thank you how are okay you? so tell us what's being said online uh, and across the media uh, on this issue it seems donald trump isn't the only one questioning the future of nato
Yes, it's very easy to think of NATO as having this kind of mythical status that it's above reproach, but it does seem that there are quite a few people out there who think things need to change. Uh, if we take a look at this article in The Telegraph, uh, the British newspaper, it's written by two people, one a former national security advisor to the Spanish government, uh, the other a former commander of British forces in Afghanistan. Um, and what they say is that Trump is right to say that NATO is obsolete. Uh, they say that for five dec decades, NATO was absolutely necessary uh, they quote its first secretary general as having said it was there to keep the Soviets out, the Americans in and the Germans down, but times change. Um, and they talk about the fact that you know, there have been calls for NATO to be dismantled since the 1990s. Um, others, though, have always said it needs to be kept there as something of a safety net. Um, but what they say is that it is fundamental now for NATO to reform and to address the problem of Islamic terrorism, because that is the number one concern right now. They say it has to revamp, reform, and it could be that, according to them, Trump is just the man to make NATO relevant again. Um, now, looking elsewhere, that, um, as that article points out, Trump may have shocked people in January when he referred to NATO as obsolete, but it's not the first time they've been criticised. This article from the New York Times, June uh, 2011, um, had the then Defence Secretary Robert Gates uh, warning NATO that its future was dim at best, dismal at worst. He talks about shortages in military spending and political will, um, and says that more member nations will have to scale up their participation in the alliance's activities. All sounds very familiar. Uh, if you've been following what Mr. Trump has had to say on the issue. Um, looking elsewhere, foreign policy have a piece that really looks ahead to the future. Uh, it's a, an imagining of September 2020, NATO is no longer. The Brussels HQ has been shuttered. Um, and it's quite a strange article, but it is quite interesting to look at. It talks about how the long whimper of NATO's demise began with the inauguration of Donald Trump um, and that his reforms essentially killed off those alliances. Um, they say he got his allies to pay more, but he also guaranteed that they would care less. Uh, what's rather sweet to notice, he does seem to think that in 2020, caring is going to be in short supply. Um, absorbed as we are in the new world disorder, nobody seems to care. Uh, he quotes an imaginary security guard who actually closed up the Brussels HQ. Uh, when he was asked where's the key, he said, I think it's at home in my top drawer. Nobody asked me for it. The uh, fallout from the resignation of the US National Security Advisor, uh, General Flynn, uh, still a subject of much fascination and it's made him, Michael Flynn, um, the butt of a few jokes stateside. Do yes, explain. absolutely. Well, U.S. comedy right now is very much focused on politics. It always has been, but more so now than ever, and it's not just Saturday Night Live. Uh, Stephen Colbert, too, is now attracting some of his biggest audiences in a very long time, perhaps even ever. And it's down to the fact that he is making these regular anti-Trump jokes. And he has a rather more down-to-earth style, uh, less exaggerated than some comics that we see on uh, US late night TV. Last night he ripped into the newly defrocked Michael Flynn um, and his apparent lack of awareness that calls to Russia would be monitored. Let's take a listen. After it was revealed there were recordings of his conversation, Flint went from absolutely not to he couldn't be certain that the topic never came up. <laughs> I know one way you could be certain. As the National Security Advisor, you could ask for the transcript. Could I, could I see that please? Oh. Oh. I, I should really not have this job. <laughs> it's, uh, it's funny because it's treason. Funny indeed. Funny because it's treason. Uh, Donald Trump has reacted to the crisis within the security services in his typical fashion. The real scandal here is that classified information is illegally given out by intelligence like candy, he has tweeted. Uh, very un-American, according to Donald Trump. Emma James, thank you very much indeed. Thanks again to our guests for this debate. Thank you, Bumma, for being with us. A pleasure to have your mm -hmm. input and your analysis. Uh, that was the France Debate. Stay with us here. More news to come.